Welcome back to the Mythic Dungeon International. We're now going into the lower finals here between Team D and Black Mamba here. At this point, we're going to be seeing who's going to go up against Battle for Champion in the grand finals and take home those land points. We do know, however, that all four top teams for land have been decided at this point. So in the case of Black Mamba, it kind of seems like they've got in, they accomplished their goal, they kind of feel complete. I mean, yeah, maybe, you know, it's just, the, I mean, that's kind of the, the mentality that we were talking about yesterday. Do you want to just kind of cross the finish line and then you're good? Let's just leave it. Let's uh, work for the land or try to get some better seeding. I mean, if they end up in fourth, they're probably, depending on the bracket lies, going to have to play against Method U first uh, or, or something like that. Yeah. So you don't want to do that. <laughs> so you kind of want to get out of that fourth spot. There's good incentive to do so. Yeah, and at this point, we're going into Waycrest Manor to start off with Fortified, Skittish, and Quaking. And Ted, I think you said, this isn't really the meanest combination of affixes we've had just yet. Yeah, with the skittish and this quacking here, uh, right. you're actually able to do the big pulls really easily. Um, so we're going to be looking to see some of the teams do very large pulls inside of Rawls' room, Lord and Lady Waycrest's room, um, looking to see how they end up uh, dealing with Heart's Main Triad and like some of the trash surrounding that. So that's going to be very important. We'll be watching that very closely as Team D definitely has the favor of Twitch chat as we enter game one on Waycrest Manor. Yeah, I mean, Wakers Manor is not something we've seen yet, actually, this weekend from the teams, and certainly a very subtle uh, affix is coming in for the both of those. Black Mamba actually starts with the essences at the beginning of the dungeon, a fairly light pull, something that we see combined with some other trash from other teams, especially in this kind of freebie of uh, combination of affixes, especially with the quaking. But Team D getting straight to the point right now as they rush in, pull the entire triad, especially all the trash in the room as well. Usually a lot of damage coming in here, especially because of that aura at the very beginning of the fight that decreases healing by 50%. Black Mamba taking it a bit easier as they're quaking pulses and they get to the heart vein triad. Yeah, uh, Long here showing why Protection Warriors are the most OP tank here, doing 100k DPS burst there. It's also in interesting to note that we actually do not see any Death Knight uh, DPS here. Unholy DK, of course, has been a fan favorite inside this Waycrest Manor because of the 1 million DPS pull inside of Rawl's room and for other reasons, just because of how big you are able to actually pull inside of some of the pulls here. And in, in, in non affix like non-dangerous affix situations here, like we do see with Skittish and Quaking, I would actually prefer to see maybe a DPS DK, but maybe there's a reason that they're not playing it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, perhaps in preparation of uh, the future maps coming up in the series, but Black Mamba has actually used their heroism on a trash pull here, looking to likely proc their first reaping and then pull that into the Heart's Main Triad. Also, just the appreciation here, appreciation here for the proc raise. We actually have Long versus Wong right now, so uh, very exciting for that series coming up between those two protection warriors. Yeah, you do actually see Black Mamba here pulling some of these captains and these, uh, guards and the witch here, electing to use their bloodless there, where Team D ended up using it elsewhere. Um, you actually do see Team D here finally DPSing down Selena. They will be moving on to Milady here in just a couple seconds as she does claim the Iris. Milady, of course, forcing you to move around a lot, ends up putting a big uh, curse on everybody, um, doing a little bit of damage, but overall not too super dangerous. Of course, Briar with a Jagged Nettles cast can be kind of dangerous, but overall it shouldn't be, shouldn't be too bad, especially for the bottom 50% here. Cast. Oh, oh, the, the Jagged Nettles cast, yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah, Briar, uh, now it, it basically enacts as a, um, a grievous wound, right? So once you deploy that 90% uh, threshold, because it does hit you for a fair amount of damage at the start, you do need to heal the player back up above 90 to get rid of that increasing bleed on them. So no problem for them as Team D is about to down the Hearts Main Triad, which uh, Fiesta essentially here on the left side, and move on to the trash that Block Mamba has already worked uh, very hard towards right now, pulling a lot of the most dangerous trash, at least for the tank in the dungeon with these guards and captains doing an immense amount of damage. Black Mamba looking to proc their 20 percent and likely I would assume drag it straight into that hearth Bane's triad and start their first boss combining it with reaping. Oh my lord team D's pull is actually enormous here. They ended up pulling the guards and the captains here and then they run it all the way back into the very starting room as that door ended up opening and they're pulling it into the soul essences so this is actually scary because they're not using their bloodlust here because they don't have it available. This is the pull that we saw from some of the west teams in the past week. Uh, now they had a raging environment so making it particularly perilous for the tanks but uh, it should be okay with the defensive ring of peace coming up. Uh, we see Long actually just opting to play a bit more offensive and dipping and not even using that Ring of Peace to his use. Black Mamba now dealing with the Heart's Bane Triad. First boss here. A lot of damage coming in on Wong as there needs to be frequent dispels coming in from those Reaping Souls, the Reaping Wave coming in on top of the team here. Finally, they get out of the Solana phase and they have full healing strength as the minus 50% healing reduction aura has disappeared and we now turn into an aura that requires you to move constantly else you will stack an increasing damage over time effect. Yep, and Team D finally does uh, get rid of the last couple of mobs there. They're making their way towards... Um, 
um, the, they're making their way towards the room here. Uh, okay, they're stopping to pull some of these captains and these guards. They're probably going to end up proccing their witch um, that they ended up not getting right before that big pull there. Um, whereas Black Mamba here, they should probably be looking to pull some of these acolytes and toads off to the side in order to be able to get some efficient count um, after uh, Selena does end up going down, after Briar does get phased here at 50%. Um, the reason that you want to pull these acolytes and toads into the boss is just because it's super efficient in terms of how much count you're able to get, especially whenever you're just cleaving it with the boss where Team D here um, doing a little bit smaller of a pull. They actually, okay, I don't actually think they ended up proccing their witch. Maybe they end up skipping it. So that's yeah, really interesting. Uh, yeah, we'll see exactly what they do with the Lieutenant Mom that spawns there. But uh, on the side of Black Mama, you don't really want uh, Sister Selena's aura kind of pulsing mm -hmm. her healing reduction aura during pulling of trash on top of that. So they do well not to deal with that as the healing tree of life does come out on the side of the rest of Druid for Black Mamba right now, making sure to get everyone nice and healthy for the damage aura coming up with Sister Milady as she dips down sub 20% health, and then they will soon work on Briar. So uh, this boss has actually proven to be quite tough, especially with these aggressive pulls that we've seen in previous weeks for some of the Western teams. But uh, Team D and Black Mamba actually do it quite masterfully on either side, one with the Reaping and one, of course, with the trash in the room. We've seen both variations throughout the cuffs on the previous weeks. Massive pull here from Team D in the courtyard, leading up to the Soulbound Goliath. Yes, yeah, so they ended up actually skipping that witch. They ended up just kind of hugging that right-hand wall in order to be able to miss the proc on that witch. Um, that's actually a very interesting strategy from Team D here, as they do end up proccing their first reaping, as they do end up killing those jagged, uh, those hounds out in that courtyard area, just having their reaping end up kind of trickling in. And then they're making sure that they do end up kill all the mobs that they want to proc their 40% uh, reaping in this courtyard area, uh, likely to set up for a 40 ish percent reaping pull into Soulbound Goliath because, of course, if you do end up having mobs that walk through that doorway, you will end up resetting the boss. Yeah, it's important to know, and you don't want to kind of commit a lot of offensive cooldowns to the boss and then all of a sudden have it disappear in front of your eyes. So Team D doing well to do just that as they reach 31% trash. Black Mamba has now moved over to this same courtyard area, dealing well with these uh, Vine Twisters, interrupting that soul fetish. Don't want that cast going off, especially if they're one of the first mobs to die. They reach 29% trash and are starting to pull some more of these Thorn Shapers along with the Corner 3 pack, which is a uh, uh, oftentimes a very optional pack. We've seen a, a really 50-50 split between team strats of what their pull order is. Team D here aggressively pulling a lot of the Rawls Hall trash mm -hmm. into the uh, into the courtyard and looking to proc their 40% reaping. Now, Tettles, you're going to be curious to see uh, most of the teams that we saw in the West will proc their 40% reaping and then combine it with Matron Brindle, the kind of mini-boss guarding the Soulbound Goliath, into the Soulbound Goliath themselves and do a fairly heavy pull. Yeah, that's actually super scary, but just because on the tank, um, it can it can just get very dangerous because Matron Brindle does do it doesn't do a t uh, she doesn't do a ton of tank damage like, uh, but she does end up just it just ends up stacking up with how much ends up coming from the Reaping Dot plus uh, Soulbound Goliath does a pretty sizable amount of tank damage if he does end up having too many stacks on him. Of course, you don't really want to reset him all the time, uh, especially on pull whenever you are whenever you do have all of your cooldowns rolling and everything else. Black Mamba here has made it to the courtyard area and they're kiting around some of the mobs. It looks like uh, one of the Thorn Guards has that Soul fetish on him. Um, so basically, whenever you do end up getting that, uh, let that soul fetish cast end up going off, um, it will end up putting the soul fetish on one of those mobs. Whenever that mob ends up dying, it will end up transferring a five stack of that soul fetish to some of the surrounding mobs. And so the storm guards with the five stack of soul fetish can actually just be very dangerous to the tank as you actually see it um, highlighted in blue for Black Mamba. And you know, it was actually a double whammy slammy there for them. It wasn't just the soul fetish that went off, but they also let a reconstruct effigy mm. cast go off. So it actually ended up healing that thorn guard to full and then buffing it with 50% damage and and haste on top of it, but here comes the big pull from Team D. Uh, actually, really not that big of a pull. They actually they combine the second reaping only with Matron Brind uh, Brindle right now, and are looking to cleave everything down and then more safely, I suppose, aggro the uh, Soulbound Goliath here. So a bit more of a modest pull, which is kind of shocking to me, especially coming from Team D. That was the first team to really do that whole you know one million DPS on Holy DK pull coming up. So very modest pull under this current affixes too. Kind of shocked to see that coming out of them, but nonetheless they have pulled the Soulbound Goliath here. 94% on the board for that is Black Mamba is wasting no time and doing that aggressive pull that we just talked about, but they haven't proc their second reaping, but will do so once they kill these uh, uh, hounds on the screen. Yeah, so so in comes the reaping here, making sure that they did have all the mobs in that courtyard area as to not resell, uh, reset Soulbound Goliath whenever they end up pulling it is very important here, but this can actually just be super scary for the tank, but this is how Black Mamba gets back into it. Team D was just a little bit ahead, but with Black Mamba making this more aggressive strategy of pulling this reaping into Soulbound Goliath and Matron Brindle, it's just very good for them. Um, so making sure that Wong, the tank, for Black Mamba getting a reset on uh, Soulbound Goliath here whenever he does end up needing it is very important. But by and large, you actually want to end up having... Uh 
you just want to reset it later as Hanks end up going down for Soul, or for Black Mama there. Now you Hank to see it as he gets res right away. And here comes the quaking on top of it. Just so much damage coming in on the group right now. Wong needs babysitting dispels constantly from these reaping waves. Only eight seconds. Uh, that you, you can only do that every eight seconds, of course, as the healer. Wop just, uh, Wong just dipping quite low. Matron Brindle has not been killed yet. So she's constantly pumping her damage on top of the Soulbound Goliath. That's just doing so much right now. Blue goes down. They don't have a battle rest available. The rest of Druid follows suit. The Rogue follows suit. And Hank is the last one to fall right before Wong. Full team wipe here for Black Mama. They've just bit off more than they could chew. They're going to have to restart completely. They didn't even manage to kill Matron Brindle. So they downed all of the uh, reaping trash. But they have Matron Brindle still up. They have to repeat the Soulbound Goliath after committing probably a plethora of just various offensive cooldowns and defensive cooldowns to that pull. Whilst Team D is sitting at a mighty 20% all the Soulbound Goliath. Yeah, you truly hank to see that one. That's actually just so bad for Black Mamba. If Black Mamba did end up wanting to get back in this, uh, into this match here, they were just a little bit behind in terms of how they ended up uh, doing their pathing at the very beginning of the instance with Team D aggressively pulling all those guards and captains into the Soul Essences at the very beginning, but Black Mamba just taking a little bit slower. Um, they, they could have afforded to take it a little bit slower since they were going to aggressively pull Matron Brindle and Soulbound Goliath, but just proving uh, why it's super dangerous as Hank ended up going down and then the Wong ended up kind of like frantically running around trying to get a reset on Soulbound Goliath because the Reaping had not ended up getting killed yet. It just ended up just being so sporadic and hectic for the group as Team D does down Soulbound Goliath, so they're tank um, long is going to be looking to run through um, pull some of the trash back into this courtyard area Yep, Team D's estranged a brother of Wong Long, the tank, pulling in the rest of the trash in the hallway right now. Now, uh, again, you know, I mentioned this was the team that kind of did that 1 million uh, unholy DK DPS pull on Raw. These affixes certainly allow for that, but they don't have an unholy DK, which is yeah. really surprising to me, coming especially out of Team D right now. So, you know, the, I, I mean, they, they might be able to set up, uh, oh my god, but disaster here for Black Mamba right now. Just got interrupted by Tettles getting particularly excited as a death's coming in for Black Mamba. Wong has gone down, so has Blue. Hank and both rogues at the moment they did get the battle res off but opted it was not worth it because they I mean the rest of the team just ended up dying so another full team wipe here for Black Mamba at this point the pull is not even that difficult they just have Matron Brindle on top of the Soulbound with Goliath and still have not managed to kill either yeah, uh, Matron Brindle ended up resetting at about 5% HP there, so that was actually very scary uh, for some reason. They end up losing the count, they end up having Matron Brindle not down, and so they're going to have to go back. Uh, third time's the charm, they're going to be looking to pull Soulbound Goliath again, just kind of throwing bodies at it. Um, whereas Team D here, jockeying for position, they're going to be looking to uh, pull some of the trash in Rawls' room. Uh, definitely a more conservative pull, but with them being so far ahead, I don't... I don't necessarily hate this. I think no, it's easy to do I, just a small pull here. I don't hate it, but I also don't think that they're adjusting strategy based on their lead right now. Okay. They just don't have access to the Unholy DK. So the whole setup that they did before and that we've seen West teams do now where you set up the third round of Reaping and the entirety of the trash in Rawl's room along with Rawl is just not something that they can really realize because they don't have the ridiculous burst AoE damage coming out of the Unholy DK because, well, there is no Unholy DK. So 56% yeah. on the board for Team D as they're about to proc their third Reaping in a moment. Uh, they might drag this with a more modest half room pull worth of trash with Roll, so we'll see exactly what they do in just a moment, as indeed all of the trash in Roll's room comes in. They have to make sure to interrupt those stewards for their dinner bell silence cast, else the entire group will get silenced. Uh, but it looks like they're not pulling it with Roll, so they're just once again being pretty modest, but once those uh, bells go it's off, actually, does a fair bit of damage to the group, and silence is long, not too detrimental as he gets dispelled from his stacks. Black Mamba, once again, on Soulbound Goliath here, as uh, the rest of Dread finds himself in just a bit of trouble, dipping below 50% health, but they do manage to stabilize, and Matron Brindle has finally gone down. Yeah, so we actually did see a lot of these m like hyper aggressive pulls from the Western region. And like you said, I, I think it was uh, it was helped by the access to the Unholy Death Knight. So it's definitely interesting to see Team D, which is a team that we renown as a world class team that we think should be very competitive with some of the Western region teams, electing to take a more safer strategy with this double rogue when walk among and then doing modest pulls, as you stated, just uh, trying to pull a little bit slower. Um, but Black Mamba here just making major mistakes. Um, Soulbound Glass down to 30 percent as Wong has elected to reset Soulbound Goliath while Team D is one like one almost full boss ahead as they have finally pulled Rawl and he is down to 75%. Team D right now, indeed, just looking quite dominant, but not in a very aggressive way. Just they're having the match kind of handed to them with Black Mamba at 20% on Soulbound and Goliath right now, as that Tree of Life should soon be fading from the rest of Druid. They managed to stabilize and get Matron Brindle down, as mentioned earlier, but their 12 deaths on the board versus Team D's zero. That's an entire minute behind the dungeon. Not to mention that they're finishing off a boss that Team D has prior dealt with, uh, I mean, minutes and minutes ago. So Team D would really have to throw this match hard to even lose. I mean, they could have a full wipe here and still recover well.
and uh, probably win this dungeon. Roll now down to 45% as Soulbound Goliath finally falls for Black Mom, and they'll be heading over into Rawls Hall, something that Team D has already well worked on. Yeah, you actually did see Rawl there. He looks like he ended up consuming two of those servants, of course, giving him a 5% damage buff um, per servant consumed. Of course, this is not the most dangerous thing just because of how Rawl's damage ends up going out. You can actually dodge all these tender rises and make sure that you dodge a lot of Rawl's damage. So um, him getting 5% per servant, not normally the most dangerous dangerous thing. The Rotten Expulsion, of course, can also be kind of dangerous, but just making sure that you kind of sidestep out of it. Him eating those servants, not exactly scary. He, he has honestly such low baseline damage that the percentage increase from the servants is really quite insignificant. The only danger is actually sitting in the groups on the ground. Those do a substantial amount of damage, even in Fortified, but um, I mean, it, it shouldn't be very hard yeah, for you to move I out of non-moving void zones on the ground. The only pain in the butt really is uh, sometimes they can cover a fair portion of the melee area. So the melee, because he has such a small hitbox, have not a lot of room to stand in the tank included with that. So you have to find some special pockets, uh, but it shouldn't be, uh, was no problem rather for Team D as they move on into the kitchen area and cleaved in all the Megas. We do see, of course, the Rune Weaver Lieutenant, lieutenant style uh, mob spawn here. Uh, they'll take have to have to take a bit to chew through that, really. A lot of interrupts coming in, a lot of tank damage that comes out of that, but they're looking to efficiently take it downstairs by the looks of it and cleave it with some of the trash in the basement. Yeah, I, I, I think that we've seen a lot of teams pulling the maggots with uh, Rawl at the bottom percent. Of course, Team D doesn't necessarily have to do this just because of how far Black Mamba is behind it. It looks like the healer Black Mamba is dropping incredibly low here. Quaking coming through as they have pulled Rawl, and then Wong looking, proccing his boss up his bargain, and the healer goes down for Black Mamba. This is so bad. They're going to end up having to reset Rawl, and they're going to have a full wipe here coming in for Black Mamba. So just another mistake coming from them, having another full wipe on a boss as Team D is making their way towards Lord and Lady Waycrest, bypassing Matron Alma, one of the most awful mobs to pull, so no no reason to pull her as they're making their way towards the bottom part of the manor. Yeah, Team D still has a, a fair bit of uh, trash to go. The, the remainder of the dungeon's worth of trash is not enough, so they'll have to go up after uh, Gorak Tool, but Black Mamba was just trying to go rolls to the wall there, and it didn't work <laughs> for them, really. I mean, it was just... But the pull died before it even started. The problem is uh, Wong grabbed all of the trash he needed to grab. He dipped down to 50% health. The healer then dipped down to about 20-30% health while Wong was even getting in position to pull the boss. And I mean, the quaking just kind of sealed the deal there. The pull died before it even took flight, unfortunately, as they come back and try yet again. 57% on the board for trash, 15 deaths as well. Rawl has been pulled. They're likely going to proc their third reaping on top of it. I mean, they have to be hyper aggressive to even try to catch up to Team D at this point, but there's just no way they're going to do it as Team D has cleaned up all of the trash inside of Lord and Lady Acrest's room, has proc their fourth reaping with it. And I wouldn't be shocked if they pull this on top of the boss. There's, I, I don't think there's any way that uh, Black Mamba does end up coming back from this, even with the most aggressive pulls that you could possibly do. It would take a major blunder from Team D. I'm pretty sure Team D could actually just pull one pack at a time, um, not even doing reaping with Lord and Lady Waycrest. They could actually just do it by itself, not even use their bloodlust, and still probably end up beating them just because of how far ahead. 15 deaths, um, three full wipes on bosses. It's just so much time that ended up being lost there for Black Mamba, whereas Team D um, is hitting Lord Waycrest, making sure that they are um, DPSing him down efficiently while that uh, reaping does stand on top of the uh, tank here. Yeah, Team D, I mean, really showing that the D doesn't stand for Deplete, it stands for Dominance. And just as I say that, unfortunately, <laughs> you Monk gets hit by one of the Swirlies that uh, spawns from killing the Lost Soul, the green Swirlies on the ground, that uh, do decrease your damage done by 10% per stack. He got hit by two of them somehow. Uh, they were overlapping, so I guess he didn't see them at all. Uh, so now he's sitting at a 20% damage reduction for 30 seconds. Uh, certainly not enough <laughs> for Black Mama to catch up, uh, but we'll slow them down a fair bit as Lady Waycrest has done her second round of siphoning her health over to Lord Waycrest. About to do her final one as Lord Waycrest has hit 35% again, and she will join the fight here for that second phase that we've seen several times throughout the weeks here. Black Mama now has finally stabilized, uh, has not actually proc their third reaping, but is at 20% on roll. Yeah, Long has actually been taking a lot of damage from these wasting strikes as well. Um, you can, of course, actually spell reflect the wasting strikes as you actually did actually see it come through here. It is a pretty uh, considerable amount of damage to Lord Waycrest says now they are dealing with both of the bosses. This is not like a necrotic setting, so these bosses aren't super scary for the tank, but it does end up doing a, a large amount of tank damage, so Long making sure that he ends up spell reflecting that Wasting Strike whenever it is in fact available to him every 25 seconds is very important. Very important indeed, and they're looking for that uh, more DPS efficient strategy right now uh, where they kind of cleave both of them down together rather than desperately getting Lord Waycrest down first, uh, as most teams do, just because he does have that increased three stack of tank damage throughout the fight every time he gets that health siphoned into him. Lady Waycrest finally going down here,
here. We will have the gloom horrors that are, I don't know why you keep calling them cats. The dogs. No, they don't look like cats or dogs. They're just some kind of weird aberration. Nonetheless, they do get pulled here on the side, all seven of them, and they will be jumping up as Ab sits at the top, uh, and they will be doing a round of hopefully well-coordinated cool uh, crowd controls to make sure that all these jumps don't get on Ab, as I was just <laughs> saying. Ab getting absolutely pillaged by these horrors. There's no ring of peace, no leg sweep, no shockwave. Finally, they overlap, actually, the shockwave and the leg sweep, so finally the ring of peace comes down, and after that it's going to ha have to be an Ursul's Vortex, and if they're not dead by then, then, well, the group will have to die, unfortunately, but TD finally stabilizes and dodges a bullet there as Ab gets pummeled down to 3% health. I don't actually know what was going on there. They were end up dealing with those dogs, <laughs> Gloom Horrors, um, not super well. Most of the time you end up just seeing like an Ursula's Vortex go straight into, um, just go straight into a Ring of Peace, and that's all you really need for those Gloom Horrors. We have also seen teams in the past pull these Gloom Horrors into Gorak Tool, standing on like a ledge in order to be able to bait those jumps to where that they don't end up happening. But it does a lot of tank damage. It can actually be kind of scary. So uh, Team D electing to take a little bit safer of a strategy here and just kind of pulling Gorak Tool by himself. Yep, and I should, be, well, yeah, they don't have any extra trash to really pull with that. They have 9% on the board, so they're probably going to have to port mm -hmm. up after Gorak Tool and pull the uh, the kind of lodge area, the fireplace living room area, full of all the hunters and the mastiffs there. Black Mamba at 58%, looking to proc their third reaping wave. They have killed Raw, they have killed Soulbound Goliath, but they still have a fair bit of trash to chew through, something that Team D has efficiently combined uh, with either Raw or, of course, uh, combined it with um, the fourth tra trash uh, reaping wave with Lord and Lady Wakerest. Gorak Tool now 55%. Black Mamba just having a bit of struggles. Wong does not have access to his Barn Zombies Bargain Trinket either. Yeah, uh, the healer actually ended up going down on the side of Black Mamba. I think he ended up getting a healer threat from some of those maggots that Wong ended up pulling in the hallway just because of uh, uh, healing threat and skittish and other reasons. And he ends up like going down as soon as Wong ends up getting back in that courtyard area. Uh, Wong does end up getting battle res by the healer, and they might be able to salvage this pull, but it's just another blunder from them as 25 deaths have come through from Black Mamba. We're Team D here, deathless on Gorak Tool. While it might not be the fastest run, we've ever seen. It's definitely uh, deathless. <laughs> Definitely deathless indeed. Gorak Tool now down to 20%. Black Mama just having so many struggles as the rest of Duard goes down again. And Wong, not long for this world, goes down. Blue follows suit. One of the rogues follows suit. And Hank is unfortunately the only one alive. Trying to run around with the speed debuffs. Does not have anything for them. And he gets finished off by the remainder of that third reaping wave. And a couple of the Magus that are still perusing the uh, courtyard there. Team D now about to down Gorak Tool. And they'll have to run upstairs over to the lodge area and get finished with the trash and just put Black Mamba out of their misery <laughs> for the rest of this map. Yeah, they're going to want to step on the snake here, uh, put the boot down. Uh, uh, they're going to be running to pull some of these survivalists. We've actually seen uh, Team Swipe in the past to the survivalist pull uh, because it can actually just be kind of scary because of their Serpent Sting cast. It can put a pretty uh, substantial dot on group members, so making sure that you do end up getting that kicked is important. Team D honestly doesn't even have to pull this very aggressively. They could honestly wipe to this pack a bunch of times and still be okay as Black Mamba here is still de uh, dealing with some of the maggots on their side, but Team D here uh, pulling the survivalists and these marksmen here just making sure to kite, kite them around and get them grouped up. I don't think they, they're even going to bother kiting them around as long as they bait the traps well and either somebody eats it with a cooldown or they just dodge to the side of them. We can see a couple of the explosive traps being eaten. Good ring of peace bump coming out of you, Monk, there as Team D hits 93%. Looking to close off as soon as possible and take this first match. Uh, I mean, they're not even take. I mean, they just had the first match given to them at this point. The Black Mamba just really poor performance. They're now at 30 deaths on the board. Uh, I guess just trying to get some kind of record here uh, for the remainder of this third East Cup. Team D, 95% and looking to close out the rest of the map. Yeah, speaking of record, I'm pretty sure the record for uh, deaths is uh, like a 70-ish. So uh, Black Mamba nowhere near that record, that death record. Uh, so maybe they want to start, start dying a little bit more here. Uh, Team D with the last survivalist master pull that they need to before they end up getting their trash and F gets freezing trap as he probably just tabbed out looking at Discord or looking at something else. Um, He's probably just going to make a sandwich at this point. Yeah. <laughs> the team does finish it off here and uh, Black Mamba's poison has been sucked out of them and they've lost the first match. One nothing, quite. Uh, that that was that was a thing, Jack. That it certainly was a dungeon there. So very good. Team D taking tank game one. No surprise there on Waycrest Manor. And let's be real, Sours. Waycrest Manor was not really on the docket for many of these teams here, and it really shows on the side of Black Mamba. Yeah, Black Mamba, a bit of a toothless snake in this dungeon. Unfortunately, they ended up just performing 
completely opposite of how they were in the previous series. This first wipe to Soulbound Goliath, or it was like so heartbreaking where the, the Wong gets punched down so that he tried to hit some fire there, but right when he ran the boss through the fire, he ended up, the fire ends up despawning so they don't uh, transition and then he gets punched in the back by the boss and dies. And then the second boss, they gave their healer the hug of death with quaking and ended up killing him. And while that was happening, Team D was having a flawless run, zero deaths all the way through. And even though we saw um, ABB get hit by freezing traps as well as explosive traps in the final room as they were killing trash to finish up the dungeon, that wasn't even enough to get one death on the board for these guys while Black Mamba racked up 30, an astonishing number. Absolutely, and at that point, it really puts us on it to the game two, which is going to be on freehold here. So hopefully a little bit more common on the affixes, but we've seen some pretty disastrous pulls on freehold with bolstering your titles. Yeah, so making sure that you do end up uh, just managing that bolstering with how you end up managing some of those mobs on the later half of the instance is very important. Of course, if you do end up uh, bolstering Harlan Sweet with the explosive rounds that he does end up casting because you want a more efficient damage on, on the trash there, that could actually just be uh, detrimental to the teams. As well, the Harpooner pack, and some of those other packs towards the middle part of the instance can be very scary as well. Uh, we did see, though, it, I think the first match of the day was Freehold for Black Mamba, and, and they did actually quite well. And they played it yesterday, too, if I'm not mistaken. Yesterday was eh, maybe not so good, a bit, a bit sloppy on their part, but they played this map quite well uh, in the morning, so hopefully they can... Well, morning there. Uh, hopefully they can kind of just shake off the cobwebs that they had here in Wakerest Manor and, and get back on track. Yeah, they'll have to enough to take a deep breath and get ready for it because we will be going into freehold on the other side of this break. So don't go anywhere, guys. The MDI will be back right after this. Welcome back to the Mythic Dungeon International with Team D taking game one that brings us on into Freehold here. A dungeon much kind of like a tall desire in the way that it has been so mapped out and maybe even overly prepared for. But that's kind of been the bane of some teams here, Slew, where bolstering comes into play and they just kind of struggle to deal with it. Yeah, bolstering is just a, a super kind of restrictive affix and it just changed your pull pattern so much. We talked about this earlier at the desk several times this weekend just because we've seen bolstering on Freehold and Freehold being one of the more popular dungeons, one of those uh, kind of comfort dungeons, just like Atal Dazar uh, early in the dungeon, similar to Dark Heart Thicket in Legion. Um, I mean, yeah, it's 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 going to it's gonna mess it up. It's going to mess teams up. It's going to kind of alter their gameplay. We've seen, you know, Black Mamba earlier in the day doing a, an oarsman pull on the side that you typically don't see teams do. Uh, you have to match the health properly. Enforcers get really dangerous. You can't pull mobs with the cannonball barrage early on Harlan Suite. So things are going to be shaken up here. And I don't think we've seen uh, Team D play this map this weekend at all. So we've seen Black Mamba. They did well earlier in the day, but let's see what Team D does. Yeah, Team D at this point, we haven't seen too much of because we didn't see them yesterday on any of the maps thus far. But they've shown consistently that they want to be able to get into that champion sp spot here, Sours. And Freehold should be the role for them. Yeah, after the performance by Black Mamba in the previous dungeon, I feel very confident saying that Team B is going to get a, a nice clean 2-0 out of this one. Now, Black Mamba, they did play quite well in Freehold earlier, but Team D in the passage has proven to be a better team. They have better routing, tend to have better damage with pools. Um, I wouldn't expect to see any Unholy Death Knights from them in this series because it, with bolstering and Freehold, it kind of defeats the purpose of the Unholy Death Knight. But with a bolstering Volcanic and this kind of like how solved almost uh, dungeons become with bolstering with how restricted you are and how you go through them. I think that Team D's just superior execution, pathing and routing will uh, get them a nice easy victory in here. Probably one of my favorite things about some of these dungeons as we mentioned, you know, it's all as our freehold because they are so solved. People just try to play as aggressively as they can here and then you have to go up against bolstering on top of it. So I'm very excited to see this one as Black Mamba should be, able, should be looking to bounce back, but we'll see if it's going to be enough for the former champions in Team D. So, I mean, title starting here, you know, we're going to see, obviously, the nine-pack pull right at the start, but I'm really hoping Team D can kind of recompose themselves and realize that in the previous dungeon we were talking about one million DPS, not one million deaths, and uh, just kind of clean up a lot of their play coming up. Both teams expectedly right out the gate are on the nine-mob pull with the three packs that are present in front of the stairs. Yeah, and we actually do see them making sure that they are able to actually kill that Enforcer as quickly as possible. One of the rogues actually got super low from the side of Team D. He might have got hit by that backhand, which is actually very bad. But making sure that you do get a lot of single target priority damage on the Enforcer is very important here because of the health di disparity between that and the rest of the pack. 
Yeah, and I mean, bolstering is, is certainly an affix that very hardly punishes you and works against you for being over aggressive. It starts to become very counterproductive when you pull too much, just because the last mobs, you're never going to perfectly kill everything at the same time. The last mobs just start to accrue so much health from those bolstering buffs that you end up in a situation where you're just kiting a, a hyper buffed mob around in circles that will one shot the tank if you get near it, and it's just not very efficient. So, nice medium quick pulls combined properly and managing their health is the name of the game for bolstering. Yeah, both teams here uh, DPSing down that first pack very quickly, pulling it into this double enforcer, double mastiff pack. The mastiffs, of course, have significantly less health than the enforcers. So, like we said, uh, making sure that you do have coordinated DPS, making sure you're hitting the correct target the whole entire time is the name of the game. The Masti mastiffs, if they live for prolonged periods of time, can actually be kind of scary for your tank because they do end up enraging. But overall, this pack shouldn't be scary for, especially for tanks that are prop warriors here. Yeah, no, certainly not. And I'm surprised they didn't do the mastiff damage anything. But uh, Black Mama, <laughs> 14 percent on the board. Team D has beaten them to the 22% spawn of this first Reaping Wave, waiting for Sky Captain Craig to fall from the sky as he does just that, and they're engaging him for his phase one. That does end at 75%. Finally, that heroism comes up for Team D right now as he does shoot random members of the Team Wong. Having a bit of trouble right now, though, as the bolstering hits from the uh, enforcers end up proccing his Bonsamdi's Bargain Trinket, so not going to have that available now for six minutes as they do their respective combination of that first Reaping Wave along with Sky Captain Craig popping their heroism as well. Yep, making sure that they use the heroism, bloodlust, drums, whatever you want to end up calling it, whatever that buff is that gives them sated and gives them haste for a little bit uh, is very important here as you actually do see them, both teams doing mirrored pulls, getting that 20% reaping, pulling it straight in the Sky Cap and Crag. Once you do end up phasing Sky Cap and Crag off his bird, he's no he's normally a little bit more dangerous because of his uh, Azerite powder shot. Um, it'll end up doing a sizable amount of damage to uh, the per people that it ends up hitting. So making sure that you either outrange it if you are in fact a range or making sure that you have a defensive available for you is very important. Certainly, we don't have many range present in these groups yeah. at all, as uh, the rest of Druid does indeed go out and starts to bait the uh, parrot poop coming down from uh, the floating mount above. Now, it always moves in a uh, clockwise circular pattern around the area and will occasionally poop down on the closest proximity target to it. So that's why the team positions here uh, right in this spot, or at least around this uh, exit area, so that the rest of Druid can be on the opposite side of the platform, not only to bait those, but also to be out of range and just have that 20% chance that hopefully that frontal Azerite powder shot does not hit anything except for, well, nothing but thin air, really. Yeah, you actually do see Black Mamba getting some of that Parrot Guano on their melee. Um, they have to kind of move Sky Cap and Crag. You actually do see the rest of Druid trying to reposition to make sure he doesn't end up getting Powder Shot here. Because if he actually does get, end up getting that Powder Shot comboed um, with that Guano, he could end up going down. Um, you actually do see the Guano again going back in melee. So it's just a lot of damage loss, and it can actually be kind of scary for your melee DPS because if they too, if they get it hit with that Guano while the Azerite Powder Shot goes out, it could be dangerous for them. Team D, about 10% ahead of Black Mamba here on Sky Cap and Crag, though. Uh, and I mean, honestly, easy one-shot potential, too. Combining the uh, time zero tick of that going on the ground along with the uh, Azerite powder shot is just a huge amount of damage. You can see it just, the powder shot itself chunks players, I mean, sub-20% heal easily. Ab actually got hit there, so he got just a bit too close for the side of Team D. He was now at 15% on Sky Captain Craig. Both teams, of course, at the 22% trash threshold with uh, the exact same pulls done prior to the first boss. Now, after this, you know, Black Mamba, we know, goes over and does the Oarsman pull on the left of the long bridge after that one in four that they're going to skip. I'm curious to see what Team D is going to do. Uh, I don't recall them doing any Oarsman pulls in previous weeks, but bolstering might uh, dictate a completely different path coming up from them. Sky Captain Craig has finally keeled over for Team D, and they're getting ready to move over and skip that Enforcer. Yeah, and they're making their way towards the bridge area. Um, you're, like you said, they're going to end up skipping that Enforcer, whether or not it's ending up uh, grappling across the bridge, just kind of using a personal stealth, uh, maybe looking to use like a Shadow Melt or something else in order to be able to reset the Enforcer to where he just ends up standing back in the same spot as you, Monk, is the only one without like a personal stealth or way to get across that bridge. Um, Black Mamba here has down Sky Captain Crag, and so they're looking to mirror um, the, the bridge cross that we did see from Team D. Team D, like you uh, stated, they are pulling this oarsman pack to the left side. Indeed, uh, Black Mamba doing the exact same skip uh, across to the bridge, and they're going to wait for Blue to be the last person to traverse the bridge and grab aggro on that enforcer so that only one person in the group needs to use a vanish slash shadow meld, and the rest of the group can save that cooldown for later as needed should it be an emergency situation or uh, a plan that they have uh, later on in the dungeon. We shall see. Team D now doing a good job to do a bump here on the rest of the trash just to make sure that the Ring of Peace is used right before they bolster, and they finally use one of their mass stealths and go right 
right through the middle of the area, making sure not to pull the rat trapper uh, unless they want to. I mean, we, d we don't worry about the small rats anymore. Of course, in previous uh, patches, they did bolster, but now there is no concern for those uh, little ship rats doing just that. But the uh, the rat trapper is definitely the vermin trapper, a bit of a lieutenant style mob. A lot higher health, very dangerous with these traps as Ab does a good job to run around and clean up the floor. Yeah, you actually do see Black Bomba uh, electing to pull a little bit bigger pull here once they do uh, traverse that bridge. Um, they ended up pulling that oarsman pack off to the side, but they ended up leaving the oarsman uh, sapped off to the side and just got the duelists out of that pack in order to be able to get a little bit more count here. Um, maybe looking to proc their 40% uh, reaping and then pulling it straight into council here in a couple seconds. Um, actually, they're going to end up proccing their reaping. Okay, yeah, yeah. so uh, they're going to end up pulling a couple of the mobs that are in front of council of captains, and they're going to end up pulling that reaping right into the council fight, whereas Team D here has to end up pulling a couple extra mobs off to the side, getting their reaping as they are prepared to pull Council of Captains with that 40% reaping right now. Yeah, one of the big restrictions that we see from uh, teams on this map with bolstering now is that you see a lot of straps that revolve around combining some form of trash with either a high health mob like Ludwig von Tortolin later in the dungeon or one of the bosses can't do that here with the bolstering. Bolstering does affect bosses as well, so you, the only thing you can really kind of efficiently combine with it is reaping. Something that we've seen a team do, do here for this, on the left side of the screen. They've now combined the bosses down to 70% health are doing well, of course, to move around the brews, the a small brown swirlies, whether it be a negative or positive brew, affecting the players or the bosses. Yeah, a lot of the time you want to see uh, some of the teams pull um, pull trash into these bosses just because of those brews that they have been getting for a lot of the time. Um, the, basically, the brews will end up giving you haste crit, or will end up doing a, a dot to you, so you, have, you only want to get the haste and crit, and then they will end up pulling the uh, mobs into the brews once they end up downing one of the Council of Captains' bosses, but on uh, this bolstering week, they can't really do that. As Black Mob has proc their 40% reaping, and they're looking like they're just like kind of standing around here, maybe waiting um, to get threat on Wong with all the reaping mobs before they do pull this in the Council of Captains. So just a little bit of time wasted here. Uh, yeah, well, what they did is a, a lot of the reaping that spawned was a fair bit away because they mm -hmm. killed the trash near the bridge. So by the time the rest of them got there, they actually ended up killing some more trash. They killed the trash off perfectly, and as the main part of the reaping came in, they had the trash dead and were ready to pull the boss. So actually fairly well timed here by Black Mamba, and certainly uh, a, a better caliber compared to the version of them we saw in Waycrest Manor right now, as uh, Captain Jolly and Raul are at about 80% apiece for Black Mamba. Uh, unlike Team D, though, who Captain Jolly is just dipping sub 10%, Captain Raul still at 25. They only have 40% trash on the board versus Black Mamba's 49. That's about uh, one larger pull's worth of percent in this dungeon, so the team's fairly neck and neck right now, and Black Mamba can certainly make up a bit of ground by playing well around those brews. It's, I mean, the, the, we keep saying it, but the key to this fight is really how well you play with the brews. Yeah, but so while they are like one trash pulls uh, uh, trash ahead of Team D. They're definitely not 60% of boss uh, health uh, ahead of Team D here, just with how much trash they ended up doing on the front uh, after that bridge pack. You do see Team D here doing a double pull here, um, pulling these harpooners here with this patrol pack that's off to the side, um, just making sure that they're able to get uh, stuns and interrupts out whenever those do end up having to come out, making sure that the blind rage ends up getting paralysis or gouge like you did see on the side of Team D is also important, whereas Black Mamba is getting both Jolly and Raul evenly cleaved down to 44%. Yeah, the problem with uh, the side of Team D there is they actually so desperately mass stunned that blind rage before it actually ended up channeling after the cast that they used two pistol shots on it and the shockwave and they all hit it before it finished the cast of blind rage so it just recast it right after but luckily they had the gouge available to them so a bit of desperate uh, lack of coordination as Yumunk dips right to one percent health on the side there dodges <laughs> death Barely as Team D mounts up, gets out of dodge right now, and Stealth's getting ready to go over to the Ring of Booty whilst Black Mamba is still working on the Council of the Captains. About 18% uh, average health between the two remaining Captains right now, looking to down Jolly first, just slightly over a rule, so their damage balance is certainly a bit uh, more efficient than Team D's was, as uh, Captain Rule is about 15 to 17% different on the side of Team D, whilst Black Mamba only has about a 4 to 5% spread between the two of them. Uh, wouldn't be surprised after this, of course, to see, um, once again, Wong and the 3D PS, as we've seen in the previous freeholds for them, pull their own trash pack whilst the rest of Druid runs over and starts uh, tra uh, starts the uh, event in the Ring of Booty. Yep, and that's actually something that you did see from the side of Team D. Um, you Monk actually dropped incredibly low as Ab was actually just off to the side, um, starting that RP and getting lightning spawned. Uh, the pig that you do need to end up grabbing here in just a couple seconds. Black Mamba here um, using their shroud. They're making their way towards that Ring of Booty uh, that Ring of Booty area. Lightning has already spawned for them. You're going to see them all walk up, grab it at the same time. So good for them in order to be able to um, skip a lot of the RP 
RP associated with that, where Team D has procced their 60% reaping and has elected to pull, pull it right on top of Ludwig. Yeah, once again, I mean, the same scenario as the Cancel Captains. You can only really combine reaping with Ludwig. He has such a high amount of health, this mini boss, that you don't want to bolster him. He already does a substantial amount of damage to the tank, or at least can do a substantial amount of damage to the tank, and just is such a health sponge. So last thing you need is buffing him with more health. 66% trash on the side of Team D. Black Mamba about to proc their third reaping and carry that over into Ludwig as well. Um, I mean, I, and you nailed it earlier, Tattles. Like, there, you, the 60% difference in boss between the two of them was not enough to make up for that 8 9% uh, advantage that Black Mamba had. They're only now grabbing their reaping over to Ludwig von Tortolin, something that Team D is now at about 15% on. So they're starting to pull a bit further and further ahead. Yeah, and you actually do see Team D here pulling some of the trash, this Brute and the Snipe Juggle right on top of Ludwig. So even though, like you said, Ludwig is a health sponge, once Ludwig did get about sub 40-ish percent, they elected to pull a little bit more trash on top of him just to have some efficient cleave. The Knife Juggle and the Brute don't do too terribly much, um, but you do see Ludwig go down, the Brute and the Knife Juggle do get a bolstering stack, um, both of those mobs, but it was just efficient cleave. I mean, it's just efficient cleave, and it will end up getting them um, closer to their fourth reaping of the instance, which they might end up pulling with Trothak. I'm not entirely sure here, as they are making their way to pull some more of the trash, though. So they're going to get that. That's exactly what they're going to do. I mean, they only have 10% left uh, before that 80% break point, so they're going to do that, especially because there's nothing to really do right now mm -hmm. while Trothak is spawning. It takes about 25 seconds for that role playing of Trothak to spawn. You can kind of see it in the top left of the corner. Yep, uh, top of the screen right now from the observers on Team D side as he ominously kind of waddles into that ring of booty. Team D making sure to cleave everything down at the same time just to not have too, something that's too over bolstered with health. Black Mamba, 71% trash on the board. Uh, it looks like they have actually pulled a four pack on top of Ludwig Barn Tolton, so slightly more aggressive than we saw from Team D, but also requiring extra management to not bolster anything too much. Yeah, you actually do see Team D kind of bolster those two uh, scrappers there for a second. Um, so it just ends up costing them a little bit more time than they otherwise would have like to have spent, but they do end up proccing the reaping. Um, it's also important to note that Ludwig von Tortolan also turns into a reaping mob, and whenever um, you do have these reaping mobs, it will uh, take 50% of the mob's health and convert it into the reaping mob, so that Ludwig von Tortolan reaping will end up being around for a while. He'll making sure that you end up dodging out of those shadow smashes is very important. Yeah, but really, as long as you do that, it's really not a big deal. He doesn't do anything else for the rest of the fight, <laughs> um, and it certainly should not hinder your damage on Trothak. I mean, Trothak's melee hitbox is large enough, especially with the rogue uh, Azrae traits. Uh, large enough that you're not going to be affected by the lost soul of Ludwig von Tortolid. Black Mamba here has dealt, uh, has a proc their fourth reaping trash as well, and pulled it similarly on top of Trothak, but 20% behind on the boss. Yeah, they've they've definitely caught up in terms of like what they ended up doing with their trash with uh, Ludwig, and then how they ended up dealing with that pack after Ludwig. Of course, Team D ended up having just a little bit of minor issues with um, their, just their bolstering stacks with how long that pack ended up lasting before they could end up engaging Trothak. So Black Mamba is definitely closer, but they're still they're still 20% on the boss behind here, so that's definitely not what they're looking to do. No, they're looking to win this match to <laughs> yeah. stay alive in this bracket right now, try to rack up as many points as they can before land, but Team D here just looking too dominant right now as Trothak does hit 57% for them. The Lost Soul is about to fall over, and they'll just have a clean sweep uh, of Trothak, hopefully, uh, leading up to Harlan's sweep. Black Mamba still at 72%. They just can't seem to close this 20-ish, 18-20% to 20 gap between the two bosses, and truthfully, it is hard to make up a, just magically a ton of single target damage on this boss. You have the rogues that can stay on the side of that shark tornado because of their Azurite traits. You have the tank that's just going to eat it to the face. You can block the whirls, um, but really you can only get so much extra damage out of this boss. You just have to grind through it and uh, hope that you can make it up with some creativity on trash later, which is further hard to do because of the bolstering. Yeah, I mean, they're, just, they're starting to kind of bridge the gap, maybe just with a little, a little bit better play, maybe with the five roll or something like that coming through, mm. um, but it, because rogues do have some RNG to the kit just because of how their roll the bones ends up working out. So, But it's not going to be like 15 percent of the boss difference, but overall, both teams here, DPSing down Trothag, not having too many issues here. Uh, both of the wrestlers are just making sure that they are kiting the sharks around super well. As we do see Ab here kiting this uh, Sawtooth Shark through those pools, um, getting him slowed or uh, stopped there, and then Ab dips into melee range of Trothak in order to be able to dot him back up, while he, and then he'll end up kiting the shark back around. So this is actually very good from both wrestlers here. Yeah, I mean, it's looking great, and Team D has actually uh, made the gap even larger, likely because they just had access to their mm -hmm. second round of cooldowns here, so uh, something that we're going to see kind of reclosed by Black Mamba. So we're probably going to have uh, Team D kill Trothak at around the 18 to 20% mark for Black Mamba's Trothak kill. Team D now just rearing up, moving
moving out of this, what is likely the last Shark Tornado. And, uh, you know, it, Tettles, I don't know, Black Mamba is, there's only so much, like I mentioned, creativity you can do with the trash at the end of the dungeon. And they certainly can't just pull tons of it on top of Harlan Sweet at the end. The only thing they can really do is try to time a perfect Cannonball Barrage as Harlan Sweet is at like 1 or 2% health and kill off a bunch of trash that way. But even that is kind of sketchy. No, they would definitely need a, uh, they would definitely need a mistake from Team D here as Team D does down. Protect the Shark Puncher! That's and exactly. they end up <laughs> making their way towards Harlan Sweet here. Uh, Team D would actually just have to make such a major blunder here in order for Black Mamba to be able to catch back up. And the reason for that being is just how far ahead um, they are. Um, you actually do see Black Mamba here downing Trothak, and it's going to be about a 30 second differential. So Team D would end up having to like wipe to Harlan Sweet, end up having uh, maybe multiple deaths, would end up being able to uh, catch them back up just because there is a zero death differential between the two teams. So maybe just a couple deaths coming through could end up making the difference that. Uh, uh, Black Mamba needs over Team D, but overall, you do see Team D here uh, kind of dealing with some of this trash here as this Ravager is going to end up casting his painful motivation in a couple seconds. Team D is actually uh, dealing with a lot of their painful motivation casts here, making sure that they do end up getting good CC out in order to be able to get the painful motivation on all the mobs that they need. Uh, they're likely to not proc their last trip because the instance they're probably only, only going to get this uh, trash to about 92-ish, 92-ish percent, um, but make sure that they're going to get the last of it with Harlan Sweet's Cannonball Barrage right at the very end of Harlan Sweet. So that was actually very good for by Team D, making sure all the rogues and everybody else ends up shadow melting off that extra trash that they do have, while Black Mamba at 93% are making their way to Harlan Sweet as well. This is actually very cool. This is actually going to be super close. Yeah, it is very super close, and uh, Team D at neck and neck, if you will, Petals. Uh, you know, <laughs> that was actually really cool to see from Team D, just triple coordination there. Uh, both rogues just off on their own, dealing with three packs, uh, Ravagers plus two, and then the tank dealing with one as well, killing everything simultaneously. Now, Black Mamba had the advantage that they were already 3% above on trash, so they only needed to deal with two Ravager packs, and now the team sit only 2% apart on trash. Harlan Sweet pulled at virtually the same time for both teams right now as Team D just hitting that 84% mark. Black Mamba following suit, and it's all going to come down really to how they handle the trash towards the end of the boss. Black Mamba does have to make up two extra percent over Team D, but this is going to be a close one. Yeah, aggressively pulling these cannonball barrages towards the end of the fight is definitely going to be the name of the game here. A lot of the time you have a little bit more leeway in terms of when you pull the cannonball barrages into the boss, and we see teams pulling like a lot of the trash into Harlan Sweet just because of uh, the cannonball barrages doing d damage to that trash, but with this bolstering affix, um, aggressively pulling a trash with the Cannonball Barrage is going to be, is going to make or break it here. It's going to definitely be neck and neck, like you said. It's going to be close. <laughs> oh, Tettles. It's going to be close, but Black Mamba's actually pulling slightly ahead on the boss, and this is a tyrannical setting, so Harley Sweet does have a lot of health. They finally entered Phase 2 right now at 60%, where he will mimic all of his abilities, of course, 360 degrees on that uh, slicing when we see it right here, and then giving the Cannonball Barrage to all members of the team, except for the tank, which we see right here. Why, thank you very much, game, for the perfect uh, RNG description as I was describing the fight. Harlan Sweet down to 52%. Team B trying to keep that gap nice and close as they're only 2 to 3% behind the team, doing well move to move out on the bridge with that Cannonball Barrage. Black Mamba just trying to, whatever they can, to maintain the lead here. And, uh, I mean, Tettles, I'm really curious to see who's going to pull trash when and how they're going to deal with it, because that's all it's really going to come down to. I mean, 2 to 3% on this boss is, is a fair bit, but we're only talking about five seconds here. Yeah, a bolstering Harlan Sweet would actually just be like what ends up making the difference here. If, if you actually are pulling aggressively with the Cannonball Barrages into Harlan and you end up bolstering him at like one or two percent, it could end up taking just a little bit more time than you necessarily need. Whereas if the other team ends up having like a perfect kill or ends up actually killing Harlan before they end up getting a lot of damage from the Cannonball Barrage, it could actually be detrimental to the team. But we do see a three percent difference between two teams. It's also important to note that we also have a zero death differential as both teams have had a deathless run so far. Yeah, and important to note as well is that we're about to go into the last phase here of Harlan Sweet right now. So he's going to be taking 100% increased damage and dealing, uh, attacking 100% faster on the tank. But who cares because he barely does any damage on the tank in the first place. So Black Mamba is going to start chewing through his health really quicker right now. And they're getting ready to do the final Harlan shuffle as they move over from the corner of this deck right now. We're going to have all eyes on the trash nearby. Likely the double enforcer pack that both teams are just ominously sitting beside. 11% on Harlan Sweet right now for Black Mamba. They have had the cannonball barrage and Team D has their own Cannonball Barrage right now. And here comes the aggressive trash pull from Black Mamba, grabbing everything together. Slicing Wind punts the teams all in every which direction. Volcanoes plague the ground right now. And here's the final Cannonballs coming in for Black Mamba as they try not to bolster Harlan Sweet too much. Huge amount of damage coming in for both sides of them. Harlan Sweet does go down, and the Enforcers are just about to fall here. But Team D following suit right now. Cannonballs going all over the place, and they didn't get enough damage on the trash as Black Mamba looks to try and close out this game and tie the Series 1-1.
Yep, they're going to be downing this Enforcer in just a couple seconds here as Black Mamba does get 100% trash count and Ooh. ends up tying it up Ooh. the series. That wow. was a nail biter. For the dungeons that they're practicing, Black Mamba was on fire there. It looked like they were a little bit behind, but they pulled it through and take game two, tying up the series one to one. That's simply incredible there, Sours. Oh, yeah. That was uh, what a comeback at the very end of that dungeon was. I thought that uh, Team D's, like, pathing and just their kill times on everything seemed to be so much faster than Black Mamba the entire time. But somehow Black Mamba found a way. They were able to close that gap at the very end. Uh, nothing mattered to them anymore. They just kind of blasted ahead. They, all the difference between their two teams was just vanished as they got to Harlan Swede. And then, hey, they killed the trash first. It's like Just as you guys said, they had better management of the cannonballs. They killed the trash faster. And even though they were a little bit behind on the trash percentage there at the very end, for a better usage of the boss's abilities to kill that trash meant that they had the victory in this dungeon. Yeah, it really kind of came down to Team D with how they ended up dealing with those Ravager pulls. We talked about how coordinated they ended up being, but it just ended up being so slow with how they ended up just getting the last of their count, where Black Mamba ended up just dealing with their bolstering just a little bit quicker and made it... After they ended up killing Trothak, they just, like, jumped straight back in, pulling Harlan Sweet without any hesitation, where Team D was just kind of sitting around, making sure the Ravagers got their good, painful motivations off on all the percent that they ended up needing, but that ended up just being the end for them. I love being able to see this pull, how tightly packed in everybody was together, making sure they got that great targeted focus out of the cannons here. And you're even able to see on the other side for Team D, they really just didn't have that at all, Sours. Yeah, the Team D, when they ended up going into this pull, they ended up just really bolstering both of the enforcers and just not killing things very well at all with the cannonball barrage. I almost felt like Harlan Swede uh, just died at the wrong time for them, where you see so they are at a little bit more trash percent but unfortunately for them, look, th this Cannonball Barrage could have perhaps been better used on the trash back there. So since the Cannonball Barrage went off uh, earlier and they weren't in position yet, the time between that cast and the next Cannonball Barrage is going to be quite some time. So he gets off those tornadoes and the team's got to reset up to just get these in. So here they come. And as you can see, we get one drop, two drop, three drops. But the team is running every which way. They didn't even do a very good job dropping those cannonballs on this trash pack whatsoever. If they had decided to kind of commit to standing in place and dropping those cannonballs on the trash, this could have been Team D's dungeon, but just really just a huge mistake in the last seconds of this map. Yeah, that was really the big failure. I mean, we, we saw it as we were casting it. It's just the, the, all four members just ran in random directions. You have the cast, not even even the casters died in the middle. It's usually the enforcers that barely go last just because of their health pool, and they didn't manage to get a single one down. So that was just really poorly coordinated by Team D. Yeah, and even just kind of scrimping on their use of utility. I mean, we saw out of Black Mamba where they drop Ursula's Vortex, hit the Typhoon, everything was perfectly stacked in together. Then they made sure that they kited it properly, and you can wait such a long time for those cannons to actually come down, and Black Mamba really capitalized on that. So before we go into game three, though, we will be taking a quick break. This has turned out to be a quite Quite a series, you do not want to miss this one. The series is tied up one to one as Black Mamba showing its strength, winning on Freehold, taking us into Tol de Gore here. This dungeon has had a number of flubs and even with raging here, Sours, the cannons have played such a powerful role, but we also have to worry about some of the explosives. Yeah, the explosives in this dungeon could bring an explosive end to either one of these teams. That's right. And uh, I think also when we saw Team D do this dungeon earlier, they, they aren't, they're not doing the thing where you pull just through the wall with Chi Burst or with whatever, whatever spell you want to pull through the wall with. And I think that if Black Mamba has that in their toolkit, they could actually get a pretty sick win over Team D here, which would be quite the upset in the standings uh, of the team hierarchy for the East if they're able to manage that one. This is also a dungeon that multiple teams are ready to practice. Multiple teams are ready to go. And it kind of showed that Black Mamba was not prepared at all for Waycrest Manor. But the fact that they're able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Team D, who didn't really make any catastrophic mistakes or anything on that freehold, really shows that this team has some pretty high growth that they can go through Sloop. Yeah, I agree. But it, it seems like the, the team kind of just, you know, I, I wouldn't be shocked if their practice routine was, ah, screw it. Let's just not deal with Waycrest Manor. It doesn't matter if we lose. Let's go for the reverse sweep. You know, we've seen that they're quite good at Told Gore if they can pull off uh, uh, that uh, Jess Howless pull. Uh, we've seen that they're obviously very good at freehold. They've done it twice today, a very successful freehold. Super clean run coming up from them. So, I mean, this could have just been in their game plan the whole time, and they may just had some fun with Waycrest Manor trying to hit some records with deaths. Yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it was very <laughs> true. But it was funny, you also mentioned before the matchup salute that this was a map that Black Mamba really did well on. 
it wasn't something that they were slouches on and it really showed there. But we've seen a number of times the Teldegor has been a dungeon. Jez Howell's room in particular here, Titles, has just been such a pressure point and caused so many wipes. I mean, a lot of teams just try to aggressively pull into Jess's room and how they end up pulling the boss through the cages can actually just be detrimental. A lot of the time, we also need to, need to be focusing on how the cannons with the explosives work out as well, though. As we're taking it on into game three here, Black Mamba looking to pull off the upset against Team D on Toldor. Back to jail we go, Tettles, as both teams right off the bat are gonna get ready, of course, to shroud at least the majority of the trash. We'll have to see if they end up pulling any of the crab packs on the way in straight to Sand Queen right now. Black Mamba, indeed, Wong grabs one of the uh, uh, rich dials, if you will, on the side of the room, along with the Silt Crabs, and immediately pop their Bloodlust, so won't have access to that for after the first upheaval, so they will lose a bit of Bloodlust uptime on the Sand Queen. Team D doing similar. Yeah, Team D, Team D also pulls some of these Vice Jaws in. Um, Black Mamba ends up pulling a, a few different Vice Jaws. Of course, not ending up uh, using their Shroud there, as you, just, you did just see Wong just kind of jumping in. Uh, Bloodlust popped at the exact same time. This is, going to be, uh, this is going to be actually just very close from both teams. I don't expect to see any deaths coming through. The Sand Queen can be kind of scary from time to time if you do end up getting comboed with uh, the Enrage from the Buzzing Drone dying, plus that upheaval. But overall, we shouldn't see t that from these teams. Yeah, upheaval is particularly scary when it's on a tank as well, just because of the massive magic hit. But on top of it, she actually melees the tank as she comes up. She melees mm -hmm. her current aggro target. So you get upheaval plus melee. So if any of those raging mobs uh, were around as well. Could have been quite detrimental for Wong, who was the one who ate the brunt of that first upheaval. Both teams at just about uh, about to hit that 50% mark. Black Mamba actually slightly ahead of Team D. 5% trash on the board. Team D's versus Team D's 6 as they both teams, of course, move around very well to bait these sand traps nearby players, group them up nicely for a quick, efficient cleave, and get rid of those enraged stacks quickly on the Sand Queen. Yeah, Ab is doing a really good job of making sure that he's in melee the whole entire time, so when those uh, sand traps do end up getting spawned, uh, they are in melee, so they're actually able to just really uh, quickly get hit. You actually do see Yu Monk uh, popping his uh, dampened harm there, making sure that he does have a defensive available. You can actually transcend that upheaval if you're a little bit quick enough, or you can roll it um, if, you, if you are quick, but uh, Yu Monk electing to take the more safer approach, uh, eating the full upheaval there. Um, and, and then Black Mamba here, it looks like they're actually getting uh, incredible. They got kind of low there for a second. We're able to actually just kind of recover here, um, but the Sand Queen is starting to go down quicker for Team D. Yeah, and uh, you know, the, the reason I was kind of grimacing as you were looking at my face there is because Blue actually got so low, he just had so many stacks from the parasites and the drones coming in because they pulled the trash on top mm -hmm. of this, and then we had, uh, of course, we're in that enraging, so once the trash hits 30%, it'll deal 100% increased damage, so Blue unfortunately ate the brunt of some of those enraged stacks as well. Yumung taking a fair bit of damage here, but no death on the side of Team D, as they have surpassed Black Mamba's damage, 8% trash on the board, and have killed off the Sand Queen first. Black Mamba following suit only seconds later, will head over to the sewer as well. I like to see this out of Team D, we talked about it earlier, just skip the parasite, both sides actually, just skipping the parasites, heading straight upstairs and just as quickly as possible are gonna try to get up to Jess Hallis's floor. Uh, they're going to, at some point very soon, pop their shadow meld and just start working at the trash on Jess Hallis's floor. Yeah, Ab actually is electing to use Mass and Tangle in this instance, so he was actually able to get all of those mobs rooted up, whereas the healer on the side of Black Mamba looks like he's electing to use Typhoon here, uh, according to the tool that we do have available for us, uh, powered by Wowhead as well. So making sure that you, uh, while Ab ended up Mass and Tangling those mobs there, um, they are just able to quickly get past them and make sure that they do end up getting them Shadow Melted off quickly. Team D here pulling some of these uh, Sea Speakers and the Arsonists here, just making sure that they do get a lot of the count here. They're probably going to be looking to pop their, uh, get their first Bloodlust uh, proc here, and then they end up pulling it into Jess' house, whereas Black Mamba in a similar situation with their trash count and what they should be looking to do here for Jess. Yeah, similar pulls coming out here. Black Mamba just on barely nipping at the heels of Team D right now, as both do the same pull with the, uh, the double C speaker pull at the start here, making sure to mitigate as many of those salt blasts as possible to do a tremendous amount of damage to the tank. We can see that there's a five stack from the Arsonist right now on Long as finally Ab decides to dispel him as to not let the damage get too out of hand with Enraging finally starting to hit on those mobs. Good Ursula's Vortex there from Team D's Ab coming in, making sure that these mobs that flee in terror when they're low percentage do not get too far from the pack so that they can efficiently cleave them down. Black Mamba, 12% on the board, looking to finish up what they can worth of trash. Uh, proc their first reaping, and I do expect that they'll do something similar and try to pull Jess Hallis through that wall. 
These arsonists for Team D are actually just super annoying whenever they are fleeing in terror, whenever they do get low health. It looks like Black Mama's just had a little bit more clean of a pull whenever they are dealing with these, and they're going to be looking to wipe them up in just a couple more seconds. They do have a couple more of uh, these uh, Iron Tide Raiders with their pack, whereas Team D just has some of the arsonists left to them. But it looks like Black Mamba, e even though they were a little bit behind in terms of trash count, they're looking to uh, kill this pack at the, the same time as Team D. Um, Team D here proccing their reaping, um, standing in one of these like little ledges in order to be able to get some of those vice jaws and those little crabs that are from outside on top of them. And they're looking to probably pull Jess through the wall here in just a couple seconds. Yeah, they've actually already done it. Black Mamba pulling just Howlis first along with the first reaping wave, finishing off the raiders from inside the cage that they opened earlier so that Jess Howlis does not open, uh, open as many mobs that uh, they need to babysit for the explosive in the second phase when uh, Jess hits 70%. Will, of course, run back through the wall and open only the far cages where the players are not intending to go. Now, hopefully they don't have any issues with some of the proximity aggro that could occur on the sea speakers on the far side of the water dome that are fighting the warden. And uh, hopefully they don't get two unlucky spawns worth of the orbs that are coming in. So the orbs are really are what you need to watch out for on this fight, depending on the amount of trash that's coming into them. They do need to be babys uh, babysat quite quite ludicrously, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the problem is when there's a combination of flashing daggers and an orb that you need to go kill as a flashing is coming out, it uh, could be pretty detrimental to the group. There's an orb on the far side there. The team's going to hopefully do well to line of sight. And actually, somebody managed to kill it right before it became a problem. Bobby finally has spawned here for Black Mamba as Jess Hallis has done the entire round of the floor and returned back to the team. Team D only now proccing their phase and uh, having Jess run off. So Black Mamba has moved nicely ahead. Mm -hmm. They're 3% behind on trash, but that doesn't even matter with the cannons coming. Up. Yeah, and the reason that they ended up uh, pulling so far ahead is because of how Team D ended up dealing with their reaping. They ended up doing their reaping just kind of by itself, maybe with one or two raiders, whereas Black Mamba ended up just pulling that reaping straight into Jess here. Um, Team D just taking the slow and steady approach here of how they're going to end up doing Jess with a, like a significantly more safe approach. But like you said, it's just put, uh, propelled Black Mamba into the lead here as Jess is down to 45% for Black Mamba, where it's only down to 58 for Team D. Team D having to deal with some of these raiders and some of these arsonists that uh, Jess did end up getting out of the cages there. I actually think they ended up... Uh, using, uh, pulling some of the arsonists from that far side. That's what you kind of saw them doing. Uh, they ended up just walking forward there in order to be able to get efficient DPS on Jess so they didn't just like kind of stand there waiting for him to run to them and uh, pulling those arsonists on top of them. Yeah, I'm going Kitty Foreman, sinking his claws into all of those explosives, doing really well there as uh, two or three spawned with all those arsonists coming in as well. So just making sure that nothing spirals out of hand for Team D as Black Mamba is maintaining about a 12 to 14 percent lead over Team D right now. But they're kind of rocketing back as quickly as they can. Just Hallis now dipping sub 20 percent HP as a ring of peace defensively comes in for the striker on the side making sure that they cleave it down with everything arsonist in there as well of course in that enraged setting but has been soothed by Ab just to make sure not too much damage goes on long along uh, especially in this fortified environment that would be a huge amount but here we go exactly what I was talking about a poor line of sight coming out of one of the rogues on the side of team D procs the cheat death something that's not going to be available now for six minutes and the biggest problem with that is the rogues are the one handling the cannons upstairs and they're going to be prone to damage not only for mobs or they fails the, uh, the tricks of the trade, but also issues with orbs spawning. I mean, they're vulnerable to explosives when you're in the cannon. You're not just magically immune to damage. Black Mamba has dealt already with just Hallis and is moving up to the cannon. Yeah, Black Mamba is just a little bit ahead and getting to the cannon just a little bit quicker here. I actually think you saw one of the explosives go off on the side of Team D from that striker that was just kind of standing there throwing that rock. Um, the other rogue from the side of Team D ended up proccing his cheat death there. As he is on the far side, he was just taking damage from some one of the packs that maybe not he didn't uh, use his vanish on. As you see Team D here uh, shrouding the rest of the group all the way through as they probably did get some of the tricks of the trade off on Long uh, before they end up making their way to the cannon. Long, of course, standing uh, in that middle bridge area. As you see him uh, running around, popping his life for potion, grabbing some of the trash, and pulling it back towards that cannon area. It's very important that these uh, that both of these teams end up keeping all of their explosives and most of that trash inside of that kind of uh, that room out in the back just because of how the explosives can be line of sighted. Huge pull coming in here from Wong on the side of Black Mamba. We know he basically pulls the entire floor as the officer on the side is now riot shielding. The crowd control has finally worn off on Black Mamba for the officer along with uh, the gunner that sits there. I think the gunner has actually already been killed, so the officer has been rooted just outside of reach of the cannon, so really well done by them. The problem is he keeps spawning explosives, but they're tending to it just with some light uh, ranged attacks with the crackling jade lightning coming in from blue and, of course, any cast from the healer as well. Here comes finally the second reaping wave on the side of Black Mamba. We do know one of the rogues 
went to the far side, and they're doing kind of a double pincer strat once again to make sure that cannons are hitting from both sides, but explosives starting to go off now, and everything is unraveling, inspiring out of control for Black Mamba as one of the rogues goes down, did not have access to that cheat death, and huge amounts of damage coming in on Wong is right now. The entire battlefield is littered with explosives. The cannon finally is manned again by one of the rogues, looking to delete the rest of the trash. Hank has popped his cheat death as well. Wong is so many stacks from the reaping and just can't get a dispel from the healer as his Bond Zombies trinket has pocked now, and they're running around in circles trying to line of sight some of these explosives uh, as the cannon cleans up the rest of the trash. Finally, the Ring of Peace goes down from Blue defensively on Wong. That was a clutch Ring of Peace and saved their tank's health, but Blue unfortunately got sacrificed in the in return, but they managed to stabilize. Unfortunately, they're now on the cusp of proccing their fourth reaping, so they're not going to be able to get that res on Blue anytime soon. Uh, it doesn't really matter because he's not doing most of the damage there. Of course, yeah. he's not going to have that Ring of Peace available for a little while as it is on cooldown, so that's pretty bad. That's exactly what we were talking about, though, in terms of like letting the mobs get out of that um, that pavilion area and w running astray into the room. You end up having explosives just kind of spread out everywhere, and the mobs aren't able to get controlled very easily as they do just kind of run around. It kind of got it got super hectic there with the reaping and everything else. Ideally, you'd like the reaping to just kind of be tanked away from the rogue. The rogue continued to be DPSing down the officers and the other normal mobs, while the rest of the group is just DPSing down the reaping there uh, pretty easily. You actually do see Ab here using that mass and tangle there. Two explosives end up going off. That could have actually just been Ooh. so dangerous for Team D. Uh, Black Mamba, though, is so far ahead here, pull, about to pull Night Captain Valeri here uh, at 93% count, where Team D still at 77%. So this is so bad for them. 77% but there. I mean, the cannons are going to make quick work of trash. They do have another 10% in favor because of the uh, sloppiness from Black Mamba with the deaths there. But you're right, Tettles, they did dodge a bullet there. Remember, both rogues do not have access to the cheat death because of the issues that they had skipping up to the cannon area in the first place. Another explosive goes off on the side of Team D. Uh, nothing too detrimental, of course. The t team only dips to around 60% HP. Ab able to just heal over, uh, hot everyone up, healing over time, and make sure that they're healthy with no more explosives going off as uh, the cannon focuses on the trash on the right side on the way to Captain Valeri, and the tank rounds up the reaping. Cannon finally starts to pay attention to that. As long as a lot of stacks finally gets dispelled by Ab, and Black Mamba doing a masterful job of dealing with Knight Captain Valeri, so that's positioned well in the corners that the melee have access to DPS or at all times. Yeah, uh, Cap Knight Captain Valeri here oh, down to 50%. Oh, no. and you actually see <laughs> what? The rogue just ends up running it before the tank. He doesn't have tricks on the tank and he ends up getting meleeed and dying? What was that? That was uh, unlucky. So Team D uh, just kind of thwarting any advantage that they had with the two deaths, closing that death difference down to one now. The rogue just runs in, absolutely <laughs> just gets dumpstered in the face by the boss. Does not have a cheat death active on the tank or the tank was too slow. Whatever it may be, it led to a silly death and the battle res that needed to come out of that. But Black Mamba also has Zero uh, battle res is available on the board, and I mean, Corgus, we keep talking about how dangerous he is. Certainly, we're in a, in a fortified environment, mm -hmm. so not as dangerous nearly, but things can go wrong on that boss very quickly. Yeah, I mean, it, you would have to see a lot of doubles just from the explosive blast on Overseer Corgus. In previous weeks, we've seen some really nasty effects, uh, uh, like Quaking paired with Tyrannical here, so that would actually just be super scary for the teams, but with the with the pretty much non effects on Overseer Corgus, I don't I don't think it's, we're likely to see a wipe, especially uh, since Black Mama does also have access to that, that Blood Lust. Uh, or the drums here as they have down Knight Captain Valeria and they are making their way on Overseer Corgus. Team D here, 50% uh, uh, health still left on Knight Captain Valeria. So this is looking very bad for a team that we expect uh, to be the second seed from the East region after uh, maybe taking a loss here from Black Mamba. I mean, I'm uh, shocked and or appalled, but we're not done just yet as Hanka yep. eats one of the uh, uh, Warden hits to the face there. Now the Wardens naturally move slower because they have an aura, but also do a tremendously larger amount of damage, uh, physical damage. So Hank kind of dodged a bullet there if he got crit he would have keeled over and died. Nonetheless, no deaths there. He does manage to pull it to the side, vanish, and Black Mama gets started here, popping their drums, their heroism, getting ready on Overseer Corgus, chewing through this fortified boss as quickly as possible, and praying that they don't have too many doubles. Yeah, uh, so bas basically doubles occur um, whenever the boss does... It, what a double basically is, is whenever the boss ends up casting two explosive uh, blasts like very uh, close to one another, and it can actually be very difficult to recover just because of the time interval in between the casts. And it's actually occurring on screen right here. You actually did see the explosive burst, then you actually did see the ca uh, Overseer Corgus end up casting that um, Azurite Rounds cast, and then he'll end up casting that explosive burst again. And you can see... Uh, you can actually notice it if uh, you're watching the Deadeye shot. If immediately following the Deadeye shot, if, if that explosive burst does end up coming out, um, you will end up getting a double. 
Yep, so uh, a bit unlucky here for Black Mama, but they seem to be handling quite well right now as they uh, rotate properly with the Deadeye shot right now. As uh, I believe Blue eats it there, or one of the rogues eats it, uh, there's no debuff on him right now, so he might have dodged or uh, parried it, or actually just dodged it mm -hmm. uh, in this case. Overseer Core is now down to 50%. Team D has rushed upstairs as well, pulled Overseer Core again, just down to 90%. Now they've popped their Bloodlust, of course, as well, and are looking to try and catch up desperately, but there's just no way they're going to be able to at this point unless Black Mamba has just, frankly, a full team wipe at this point. Yeah, Black Mom has actually been blazing through this dungeon. We actually saw some of the, uh, the one of the fastest times in time trials was like right at 14-ish minutes. It was about 14.10 or so. Uh, Black Mom is looking to try to like match a similar time here. They're probably going to be in the 14.30 to 15-ish minute range while Team D here just having some of the issues um, earlier on in the instance with how they ended up doing just like super slow with not pulling it with a reaping and just making a more conservative side. But the, the tank for Black Mom just went down. And they don't have a battle oh available. Goodness. I just mentioned it's not available on? for six minutes right now. So they're going to try to kill Overseer Corgus for the remaining quarter of health. They're committing to this idea, but they don't have the kind of cooldowns required to survive 25% as Blue goes down as well. The healer is about to go down. There is no way they are doing this boss without the tank for a quarter HP, so they're going to have to just succumb to the idea and have a full team wipe right now as Sours bows his head in shame into his hands. Team D looking to pounce and capitalize on this uh, on this uh, wipe here from Black Mamba. The rest of the match has been handed to them, and it looks like Team D is going to squeeze by on this one. Alexa, Q sound music. Uh, Steam D here, a 30% left available for them on Overseer Gorgas. Uh, they would definitely need, um, basically Ab would end up having to die here for them to be able to lose this match um, because Ab is the only available battle rest for them just because he is that Druid class. And with Overseer Gorgas at 20%, they could probably, they might be even be able to do this without a healer from this point on. If the healer dies here, they, they would be fine. If yeah. the tank dies here, maybe that's a different story, but it doesn't really matter. Team D has 89% trash on the board. That's just enough to make it up with the remaining five mobs that are on the balcony behind Corgus. Corgus now single digit, 6% left, 6% uh, health left for Corgus as they're preparing to down the boss and head back over to the cannon. Black Mamba, nothing but trouble again as two more deaths plague them on their run back up to Corgus. This was, uh, this was unlucky. Yeah, Team D here with 89%, uh, so they just need a couple more mobs with the cannon here in just a couple seconds. Um, Black Mamba here going to be looking to pull Overseer Corgus in just a couple more seconds as Wong has positioned and is getting ready for Overseer Corgus to spawn before they do end up pulling it. Uh, Team D uh, is getting just these couple priestesses in, in position, uh, looking to kill these Ashfiend Wardens as well with the cannon. Yeah, I mean, this is, like, what a shame. I mean, what, what a throw from Black yeah. Mamba. Just... It's just, you know, they had such a good clean run up until now. Just a bit of sloppiness in the cannon area. They managed to recover it, but, I mean, just what a throw. Overseer Corgus, 25%, and the tank goes down. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what he got hit by. I'm going to assume uh, that it was the, the pattern on the ground, of course, but that's all it took with Team D being right on their heels the entire time. They managed to clean up the series 2-1 and are moving on to the grand final yet again. Team D just squeaked by on that one, just off the back of Black Mamba's scaly failures here. That, that dungeon was theirs, Sours. Yeah. It was in their hands. They were going to go to the Grand Finals for the first time. I was excited for that. That would have been like the first major upset, I believe, out of like for yeah. any standings in any tournament, right? Where Team D, well, they were looking pretty good. They, they had the lead in the beginning. They were doing good. And then all of a sudden, I, I think that they just aren't as practiced with pulling Jess through the wall. They weren't really prepared for that strategy. And then when Black Mamba did it, they did it just a little bit faster, a little bit more efficiently than Team D was able to. And then they had a huge lead from there on out that they just they just let go somehow on the final boss letting like what do they even use their battle res on like it was such a shame that they didn't have any of those available because i guess you know if you have two deaths and you use a b res for both of those deaths oh, oh, oh. The cross ignition, you, no. you just assume that you won't have to use it on the last boss but then if you just get overconfident and you you look away for a second. Next thing you know, uh, cross ignition crosses you guys off the leaderboards, and you're you're done. Your your tournament life is over. But they made it to land, and that's all that matters. That ignition was fresh out the kitchen, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. All right. They do end up making it to land, but that has got to be a heartbreaking loss for Black Mamba, even still. But it does mean that Team D is going to be moving on into the grand finals to start off against Battle for Champion once again. So. I'm curious on this one, Tettles. Do you think it's going to be the same thing we've seen the last two Eastern regions? One team 
beats the other in, in the upper finals, they go to the grand finals, and then they get trounced and then lose in the grand finals. I mean, I think with what we just saw from that last series, we would actually, I would expect to see Battle for Champion just kind of clutching it. Uh, Black Mamba actually probably should, they definitely should have won it series. That was ridiculous that they ended up wiping on Overseer Corgus at the last moment of Overseer Corgus' life, and they should have, Team D shouldn't even be, the, be in this position in the finals here, so I actually expect Battle for Champion to kind of take this one. Yeah, at this point, I think that with seeing how well these teams have been able to play, it's kind of interesting the, the growth of Black Mamba, though, on that side of it. For the dungeons that they have practice loot, they were incredible. Yeah, and I mean, you know, they were just banking on <laughs> reverse sweeping with the dungeons they had practiced. They were almost there. Yeah, I, I gotta say, man, I feel for Wong. I know what it's like to be a tank in that cubby. Your your visibility is zero. Half of the time, you're just guessing, especially if there's any ground effects, if you have Avatar popped in, your character is larger, you just have zero visibility on what's happening, and you kind of need to just memorize the pattern of that cross ignition. But also, shame on them for getting in that position, because you can actually position them at the bottom of the stairs and kind of see the pattern a bit better. So, unfortunate for them, but... Uh, I am very impressed with their growth. They were just such a spotty team starting out with this uh, tournament, you know, four weeks ago, I suppose. Uh, and they've really grown and uh, in my eyes have, you know, deserved definitely to be on the, uh, the at least the second place pedestal there. Without a doubt. And as we mentioned, Team D is moving on into the grand finals. Black Mamba, unfortunately, getting eliminated there. There's pretty much a Cinderella story that we were able to see into it. And hey, maybe it bows well for land coming up in June here, Sowers. Yeah, and I think, like, also, Black Mamba, we talked about this a little bit, but a while ago in China, they did have, like, uh, in some of the PC bangs in China, they had little tournaments set up where they brought in a bunch of players and on similar tournament realms, sort of like the MDI completely localized in China. Not a lot of it known about these tournaments from the West, from other regions. And Black Mamba is a team that does actually have experience playing in that. That's where they met. That's how they formed. So it could be an actual advantage for them moving into the land where not a lot of teams are familiar with playing together in, in an area uh, in the way that you would in a PC bang like that.